Who am I describing here? An imperialist right-wing twat bag who couldn't take criticism, eaten educated, and wanted to be Prime Minister from an early age. And once he got the job, couldn't be bothered doing it. I am of course referring to Archibald Philip Primrose, 5th Earl of Rosebery, who was Prime Minister between March 1894 and June 1895. He was also probably a massive paedophile. This is Past Force. Primrose was said to have had three aims in life, though this may be apocryphal. He wanted to win the Derby, the horse racing Derby, which he did in 1894. He wanted to marry an heiress, which he did. He married Hannah de Rothschild one of those Rothschilds. And he also wanted to be Prime Minister. And this was in the days when only really the landed elite, the wealthy, the rich, could afford to even hope to become Prime Minister. They were really the only ones entitled to become Prime Minister. But just because you're entitled to the job, doesn't mean you're suitable for it. And Primrose most certainly definitely wasn't suited to the job. He was said to have been this great public speaker. Some people said yes, yes he is this fantastic, fantastic speaker. And crowds would flock to see him. Other people said great public speaker, what the hell are you talking about? He's overly dramatic. He's ridiculous when he's public speaking. And after each speech, he'd collapse from nerves. Well, some people say it was nerves. Other people say it was because he took massive amounts of cocaine. He had a real hatred for democracy, a real proper hatred. He didn't believe in it. He called it Tom, Dick and Harry business, which in other words was meaning it was trivial. It was a nothing. This is ironic as we shall see in a moment as it was democracy that did him in. Whilst he was foreign secretary, he managed to enrage every single government in Europe. And then in March of 1894, William Ewart Gladstone resigns as prime minister and Primrose takes over. Thanks to Lord Harcourt and his son, I'm not making this name up, Lulu, every piece of legislation he tried to pass as Prime Minister got blocked. And so he lasted just over a year in office, and in June of 1895 there was a general election, and Bob's your uncle, he got voted out. According to The Spectator, he was the great lost leader of Victorian politics. Great? Not in my book. He managed to get no legislation passed because of Lord Harcourt and Lulu. He enraged every government in Europe when he was Foreign Secretary. And he may have supposedly been a great public speaker, but who wasn't then? It was literally taught. They taught in the public schools the art of oration, which even today in the public schools isn't taught. That's why the current Prime Minister can't string a sentence together, because oration isn't taught. He was probably one of the worst Prime Ministers Britain has ever had. Until last year, he may even have been the worst. And he only got where he was in life because he was the son of an Earl. He was landed aristocracy. He was public school educated. He only got where he was because of his position in life. 
and he also only got ahead, got to where he was, because people thought he was good at public speaking, because people came to hear him speak, to see this ridiculous, overly dramatic man trying to make a speech whilst high on cocaine. He apparently modelled himself on William Pitt the Younger. What? You mean he drank a lot, got into massive amounts of debt, and started a war with France that lasted for 20 years? No, 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 no. But he did like to gamble. And actually, he was nothing like Pitt the Younger. And besides which, he had a very dodgy personal life, which is full of speculation and conspiracy theories. His landed estate in Scotland, the Rosebury estate, was called Dalmini. And he also had loads of other properties, including Mentimore Castle, which was the setting, the location for Wayne Manor in Batman Begins. It's also appeared in like a lot of other films as well. But his main estate was Dalmini in Scotland. And on that estate was a ruined castle Barn Boogle, which he restored, and he lived there separately from his wife and children. He had four children, two boys and two girls. He lived in this Barn Boogle castle separately, where he would lock himself in the library, writing his political biographies, like some sort of gothic, unspeakable creature. It was also rumoured that in this castle he kept a number of locked cupboards. What was in these cupboards, it's speculated to have been his secret diaries. Although, probably there was nothing in them because Primrose liked to cultivate this air of mystery about him. He liked to act all mysterious and enigmatic and woo annoying in other words but the speculation doesn't end there because supposedly he was also a homosexual and he went to great lengths to hide his sexuality we've all been there but also he may have been a massive, massive paedophile. When Primrose was at Eton, when he was a young boy, and before his father took him into the city to see a marching band, when he was at Eton, his tutor was one William Johnson, who was a massive, massive massive paedophile who allegedly abused an enormous number of his pupils. And in 1864, he and young Primrose went off to Italy together, to Rome. What happened there is, again, pure speculation, but there were rumours and gossip at the time about what they were what they were doing there. In 1872 Johnson was sacked from Eton. He was dismissed, forced to resign amidst accusations of, of paedophilia, of fondling his pupils. And then he went to live abroad. And then, after a few years, once the scandal had died down, he came back again. But he and Primrose, they kept up this, this correspondence right up until Johnson's death in 1892. They were incredibly, incredibly close. And Primrose himself, in 1929... He even died listening to a song, at his request, he died listening to a song, the Eaton Boating song, that 
Johnson had composed. Make of that what you will. But his best friend was, Primrose's best friend, was a guy called Reggie Brett, Lord Escher, who was also a pupil of Johnson's, and who was also a massive, massive, massive paedophile. Okay, so he knew two paedophiles. Does it make him a paedophile, right? No, of course not. Doesn't even make him homosexual. So where did the rumours of homosexuality come from? Well, for that we need to look to his private secretary, Francis Douglas, son of the Marquis of Queensbury. There was speculation that Primrose and Douglas were having an affair together, that they were lovers, and it's speculated that Douglas only got the job of private secretary to Primrose so they could be close to each other. Now, Douglas was the son of the Marquis of Queensbury, who was firstly regarded as mad, and secondly, a raging homophobe. And he tried to, to, he heard the rumours of this affair and he tried to stop it. He, at one point, followed Rosebery to Germany, to a hotel, and he went there with a dog whip, and he was going to give him a thrashing, beat him to within an inch of his life and try and try and stop this affair. He only didn't give Primrose a thrashing because the Prince of Wales, the future Edward VII, intervened. And then, Francis Douglas died in 1894. Supposedly, he shot himself accidentally Although there are rumours it was suicide, or possibly even murder. Nobody is quite really sure how he managed to die. They know it was gunshot, but they don't know if it was suicide or murder related to this affair with Primrose. Regardless of whether it was murder or suicide or an accident. It was this incident which caused Queensbury to go after the playwright Oscar Wilde, supposedly to protect his second son, Alfred, from snob queers like Primrose. And it's rumoured that Queensbury blackmailed the government into supporting him against Oscar Wilde and that the government went along with this to protect themselves from a, an even bigger scandal, a scandal, the biggest political scandal since James II turned out to be Catholic, to protect Primrose. There has also been a rumour that police patrolling Hyde Park looking for men who were picking up other men to arrest them not for that reason. There's a rumour or speculation that they were told if you see Primrose don't arrest him just just let him be right and supposedly again this was to avoid a massive massive political scandal. But saying that, according to Primrose's biographer, Leo McKinstry, he wasn't homosexual, he was just lonely. Which, quite frankly, is a rubbish excuse. Because another biographer of Primrose, John Davis, says, actually there were a lot of rumours 
going around at the time about this and it was taken for granted in gay circles that Primrose was gay. And since McKinstry has written for the Daily Mail, the Daily Telegraph and the Daily Express, the holy trinity of right-wing twat-bag journalism in the UK Of course, he's probably going to try and sweep that kind of thing under the rug in a biography that is supportive of Primrose. So, I'm, I'm more likely to go for Davis's argument that there was a lot of rumour, there was a lot of speculation, and there's no smoke without fire. But, homosexual does not equal paedophile. No, of course it doesn't. Well, this is where it gets interesting because, allegedly, Primrose was sexually infatuated with his own son, which would make him not just a paedophile, but an incestuous paedophile, if it was true. Circumstantial speculation, right? Right. But let's let's look at the culture that Primrose was was embedded in. He was close friends with his tutor, he, had an, he allegedly had an affair with his tutor, who was known to be a paedophile. His best friend was a paedophile. He was at Christ Church College, Oxford, which he didn't graduate from, where one of his tutors was Lewis Carroll, another alleged paedophile. His, his political rival, Lulu Harcourt, owned the largest collection of child pornography in the country. His cousin was also infatuated with his young son, sexually. His cousin's young son, by the way, not, not Primrose's young son. Primrose was surrounded his entire life by paedophiles. He was embedded in this culture of paedophilia. And it wouldn't surprise me if there was this this large paedophile ring in the upper echelons of Victorian society allowed to go unpunished, unaccounted for. It was just allowed to happen. It wouldn't surprise me if this paedophile ring existed and given the circumstantial evidence, it wouldn't surprise me if Primrose himself was indeed a massive paedophile. History! It's a thing of the past! It's a thing of the past.